Okay, so uh, we're going to go ahead and get started because we have so much to talk about tonight. My name is Kristen Hassan. I'm the director of American Pets Alive and the Human Animal Support Services Project. If you're not familiar with Haas, check out the website at www.humananimalsupportservices.org. We are here tonight with uh, my with our colleague, Professor Katja Gunther, who has joined us before. She wrote one of the most important books that has been written to date uh, about animal sheltering, the lives and deaths of shelter animals. And we're so excited to welcome her back because we started about a month, a little over a month ago, the conversation with her and we were just getting into things and the hour ended. So we're so happy to have her back. Welcome, Dr. Gunther. Thanks so much for having me again. It's great to be here and to see everyone. So, a lot of people are joining us who attended the first uh, webinar, but not everyone did. So can you give us just a, a brief overview of the book and how you came to write it and, and generally what it's about? Yeah, absolutely. Um, the book, again, is called The Lives and Deaths of Shelter Animals. Um, and from my perspective, it's really an analysis of what I consider sort of the social world of a high intake, high kill public animal shelter that is located in the Los Angeles metropolitan area. In the book, I call the shelter the Pacific Animal Welfare Center. That's a pseudonym, a fake name. Um, so I, when I refer to PAW, that's uh, what I'm referring uh, to. Um, and I came to my research on animal sheltering as someone who has a background um, in sociology. That's the discipline that my PhD is in. Um, but I'm currently a faculty member in an interdisciplinary department of gender and sexuality studies. And so I kind of approached this, this project from both personal but also scholarly vantage points um, that I think enabled me to have kind of multiple perspectives um, in this work. I um, in a lot of ways, it was research that I considered sort of accidental research. Um, I actually had started my first relationship with Paul was as a volunteer there. Um, I started volunteering in the winter, I guess it was of 2012, um, and I volunteered for a couple of years before I decided that I wanted that to be a research site um, as well. And what really stood out to me, you know, as a volunteer in that setting was that there were so many interesting dynamics taking place in the interactions between the different groups of humans that come into contact with each other at a large public shelter like this one. You've got obviously people coming in from uh, the public who are seeking different kinds of services, adoption or licensing. You've got the staff and then within the staff, there's also kind of different subgroups where at least in this shelter, um, there was quite a divide between the upper level management and kind of the everyday workers and particularly those who are actually working out in the kennels with the dogs and cats um, who were impounded at the shelter. Then there was this large group of volunteers um, who are almost entirely uh, women um, and then there was sort of the broader community, of course, that the shelter um, was serving. And what I really saw is that people and animals in that setting were just engaged in really near constant negotiations about a whole bunch of really important um, questions, including questions like who's actually deserving um, of being the guardian to a companion animal? What kinds of people or what people should we be taking companion animals away from because we consider them you know, unsuitable? Um, which animals should we make available to adopt and which animals do we consider for one reason or another to be unadoptable? Um, which animals get to live and which animals do we decide have to die here? Um, who makes these decisions and what justifications do they offer for those decisions? And then also from the perspective of impounded animals themselves, um, you know, most of the literature on sheltering really doesn't take into account at all the perspectives of animals. I wanted to explore how the animals also experienced the shelter um, and how they um, engaged in different acts of resistance to how humans at the shelter tried to control them um, and tried to control uh, their, uh, their behavior. Um, so coming at this um, as someone who both had you know, extensive experience as a volunteer in the field setting, um, but also as someone who has you know, background in a specific set of social science and humanities uh, disciplines, um, I really brought with me attention to intersectionality, um, which is a concept that refers to the ways in which different identities that people have and also different social structures in our society intersect with one another and often reinforce each other. 
Um, so generally, when we talk about intersectionality in a field like sociology, we're talking mainly about race, class, and gender. But of course, in a system like PAW, we also have to talk about species. Um, and one of the, the main ideas that I talk about a fair amount in the book and kind of flesh out at various places um, is a concept called anthroparchy, um, which refers to the social structure of humans' domination of non-human animals and also of the natural world more broadly. We obviously live in a deeply anthroparchal society where the vast majority of people believe that it's okay uh, to use animals for whatever needs they can fulfill for humans, whether that's companionship, like companion animals, or food, uh, like uh, factory farmed animals. Um, and so in, in approaching the project, I wanted to, uh, to attend not only to the race and class and gender dynamics of the setting, but also to the inequalities um, of, uh, of species. So I don't wanna to talk too much about the findings and I know there are a lot of questions um, to get to uh, as well, but hopefully that gives people who haven't had a chance to read the book or who weren't at some of the previous events a little bit of a sense um, of some of the themes that I'm trying to or tried to address in the book. One of the questions that came up um, when we spoke to you about a month ago was what does, how does your background in gender and sexuality studies relate to animal welfare? That wasn't apparent to people um, when you when you shared that. Yeah, absolutely. So I actually came into this, came into research in general on animals through a subfield within gender and sexuality studies that's called feminist um, animal studies. Um, and that's sort of a subgroup of a slightly broader, but still very small field called critical animal studies. Um, and feminist animal studies draws from and sort of builds on some of the original um, body of theory that in the 1970s was called eco-feminism, which some of you may have, have heard of or encountered um, in some way. Um, and eco-feminists really in their theory and in their research draw attention to the ways in which women and animals have a lot of shared social experiences in our society. Um, they're both groups that historically um, and sometimes still today are defined as being importantly different or other than men and also as being inferior to and less than uh, men. They're uh, part of sort of the um, liberal enlightenment um, dichotomy between uh, nature versus culture. Um, men and culture are always on one side and women and animals and nature are on the other side. Um, and so part of what eco-feminists uh, wanted to do and feminist animal studies carries on this tradition um, is to really pay attention to the ways in which uh, how we treat animals also reflects and um, vice versa as well, um, how, we, how we treat women. So there's been some fantastic research in writing, for example, on the um, uh, similarities between how we talk about and think about the butchering of meat and celebrate meat consumption in our society and the kinds of lenses we use for making pornography um, in the United States and in other, uh, in other countries. Um, women as a group as well, because of their much higher um, rates of interpersonal uh, violence, particularly perpetrated by men, are also seen in the feminist animal studies framework as kind of sharing some of the similar position of being more, um, or I should say less, less empowered or more powerless uh, in our society um, than men typically, uh, typically are. Um, so that's sort of one sort of foundational place. It helps explain as well why it is that when we look at the sheltering industry, certainly among volunteers across shelter systems, they're overwhelmingly women um, who are doing this work. When we look in, at staff, the gender balance tends to be more mixed, which I think also reflects some of the ways in which animal control comes out of a policing tradition um, rather than a caregiving tradition. But as we see shelters moving more into the caregiving, we also generally see that the proportion of women working there increases. Um, so this is kind of a, a, a feminized area as well, um, you know, animal sheltering uh, specifically. I mean, in the book, I talk quite a bit specifically about the experiences of volunteers as women, um, and also uh, try to illuminate the ways in which the work that shelter volunteers are doing, certainly at PAW, um, I can't speak for all shelters, of course, but certainly at PAW is actually political work, um, even though we tend to dismiss it in our society as being kind of the typical caregiving um, labor that women normally do. Um, so we tend to devalue, I think women's activism is always at risk, much more so than men's in our society as being seen as caregiving or being framed as volunteering. 
and not as to being seen as actually making meaningful political change. Um, and that's one thing that I really tried to illuminate in the book is how women who are volunteering in the shelter use different frameworks and practices to challenge uh, the way that the shelter treats animals and also sometimes treats uh, the community and the members of the community it's serving. Thank you. Um, so I want to move to a really practical question. How do you think in the book, you know, you, you have a really distanced relationship to shelter management in the book. You don't really interface with them very much. Uh, at least it's not apparent. And you chose to use a pseudonym to talk about the shelter. And there's, there's just this real distance between your on the ground work and it feels like the management's almost completely absent. And I guess I wanted you to talk a little bit about that because um, I think it is an interesting, it, to hear about your experience from a volunteer perspective is really interesting and how you think, what you think could change about that. Like what you think management could have done in that situation better and what, what advice you might have for those of us who because of the nature of the work we're expected to do running shelters, we are pretty distanced from the animals themselves. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a really, um, a really terrific question. And um, I think this is true in a lot of, you know, larger public shelters, especially that PAWS uh, management system was really nested. Um, so I did actually have a huge amount of contact. If I were to identify any group of staff I had the most contact with, it was actually managers, um, more so than kennel attendants, but it was mid-level managers as opposed to the upper level um, managers. Um, and this was a, a setting, a shelter setting that was very hierarchical, um, you know, where people kind of had their ladder on the career rung and um, uh, everyone sort of knew what their place was and what the, the chain of command um, was. PAW is also part, as many big shelters are, of a multi-shelter system. Um, so not only was there the shelter management, sort of the top manager at PAW itself, but then there was a whole additional layer of managers that worked at the head office that was located almost an hour away in Los Angeles traffic. Um, you know, and, and those were people that we rarely, if ever, saw on the ground um, at PAW. And so the only way to really communicate with them was either through email, um, which did happen a fair amount between volunteers um, and at least some of those upper level managers. And occasionally we would have in-person meetings as a group of volunteers with one of the higher level um, uh, managers. But I do think, um, Kristen, that you know, your observation you know, that, that managers are, are doing a lot of different tasks and it's really hard for them to be on the ground, um, you know, kind of interfacing with what's, what's happening um, is, is right on point in terms of what I observed at, uh, at PAW. And I think at that particular shelter and in that particular shelter system, there was also a very strong sense on the part of the volunteers, but also on the part it's my impression of pretty much all the staff, including even the managers at the, at the shelter site, that what happened at the headquarters was a total mystery. Um, the people didn't understand how people up there were making decisions, why they made the decisions that they made, why they made them when they made them, um, you know, how they were communicating those decisions to others and so forth. And so there was really this sense of kind of you know, the, the, the bigger headquarters of being like a black box that was totally opaque and none of us could really figure out how to get into it, how to understand it, how to make sense of it. Periodically, somebody would get plucked as a manager out of PAW and put into that higher level office. And then there would always be this sort of fluster of excitement. Oh, yay. Now we have someone who knows this shelter, you know, in that position. And this surely can only mean good things for us. Um, you know, they're going to treat us differently than we've been treated in the past by the you know, by the head office. Um, and that's not actually what happened. They would just kind of disappear as almost like they got sucked away by the Wizard of Oz behind the curtain. And we, you know, never saw or really heard from them um, again. So I do think, you know, in these big multi-shelter systems, you know, a pause system was such that there was a, sort of a, a, like a deputy level um, person who was assigned to be responsible for multiple shelters in different geographic areas. And I think it would have been immensely helpful even if that person had a physical presence at some regular interval, you know, at the, at the shelter. They didn't, you know, periodically, um, I think I saw that person in the time I was doing field work twice um, physically at the shelter. Um, and so, you know, I think being there, um, not necessarily, um, uh, you know, constantly, that's obviously not possible, but even having something like an office hour, 
where people would know that you're going to be there at this particular time and you, you know could drop in and talk with you either as a group kind of rap session or on an individual basis if you're a manager would be you know a terrific thing to also to just communicate in general to staff and volunteers that you value their opinions um, and their insights for those who've read the book you already know that that absolutely wasn't the case at this particular shelter where decisions were always top down um, and where there was never the sense from you know, anybody at the lower levels that what volunteers or staff who were working at the shelter thought actually mattered for anybody you know, making policy decisions for the shelter system um, as a whole. So I just think being transparent, um, you know, I guess it's the, it's the broader take home message. There's a lot of different ways to accomplish that, but practices like, like office hours, practices like making yourself physically visible at the site of the shelter or shelters that you are responsible for at some predictable regular interval that's accessible to a reasonable number of people, right? Tuesday mornings at 10 probably isn't the best time to get a lot of volunteers there. But if you can show up the first Saturday, you know, of every month for 90 minutes, um, you know, that would, that would probably be, you know, a fantastic thing um, where a lot of staff and, and volunteers would be able to see you and interact with you and talk with you about things that are going on. Thanks, that's really helpful advice. Um, we have a question in the Q&A. Are you doing follow-up work or research around this area after the book? Um, yes, I am. Um, I One of the things that always happens, I think when you engage in any longer research project is you end up with more information than you can actually use in your, your book. So I have a number of papers um, that I'm working on that are from data that was already collected during this period. Um, but I'm also looking at, because I've been really interested and excited by um, how much social justice frameworks seem to be getting more attention right now um, in the sort of animal sheltering industry more broadly. Um, so I've just recently started a new project um, of kind of observing and documenting um, different ways in which the animal sheltering industry, not PAW specifically, but lots of different shelters and also animal welfare organizations are, are trying, if at all, to kind of implement social justice and community orientation into the work uh, that they're doing. So those are, those are some of the current things. So I... You know, in reading the book, this is a massive challenged shelter that many people may not be familiar with how hard it how hard it is um, in a shelter like that where you do have a multi shelter system and disconnects. Do you think that do you believe that change meaningful change will be possible within that structure or do you believe that structure that that kind of the way that a government shelter operates, and I'm having run three, you know, I, I, I sort of am skewed on this a bit, but do you think that that whole structure needs to change or that we can make change within it? I, I think the ideal scenario would be for the whole structure to change, um, frankly. And I think there's a lot we can learn in animal sheltering from um, a movement known as prison abolition. Um, you know, that's working towards the, the goal, recognizing that it's not a goal that we're going to achieve in my lifetime, or probably even in the lifetime of, you know, people who are children's ages now. Um, but trying to really think about what it means for us to be keeping certain populations of people or animals in cages, and what it would look like if we could really radically transform our society so that we no longer accepted that as a social practice, and also, of course, no longer engaged in it um, as a social practice. Um, you know, in terms of, of things we can move, movements we can take now, um, you know, to get us there, you know, I do think already, even just in the last couple of years, there's been a lot of positive change in many animal shelters, you know, adopting more of a community orientation um, that was sort of starting to develop at the shelter I call PAW in the time that I was there, but continues to be relatively um, weaker. Um, <laughs> There, there are certainly, you know, kind of the usual hobgoblins that pop up and talking about how to re really radically restructure um, animal shelters. You know, if every shelter could be, you know, physically like more like Maddie's Adoption Center or some of the shelters I visited in the Pacific Northwest in Oregon and Washington State that seem almost like country clubs for dogs and cats. Um, you know, that would be a huge, a huge change right now, at least in Los Angeles. That's not something that's happening. This, the money is not being allocated in those areas. And I think now with the COVID-19 related 
economic downturn, even less money, you know, is going to be allocated into these shelters. Um, the shelter where, where I did my field work was built in the 1950s. It's undergone some very basic kind of maintenance work over the years, you know, repouring of concrete and painting and replacing of, you know, chain link. But fundamentally, it's basically the same as it was 60 years ago. Um, you know, the kennels are far too small. The cages for cats are really outrageously small, um, even worse situation than for dogs. Um, you know, they've started to introduce and, and now have some enrichment programs, but there's a huge amount of work that still, that still needs to happen, um, you know, to get to a point where I think those shelters can be viewed as, you know, humane or progressive institutions. Um, and when I think about a shelter system like PAW, it's hard to see how that shelter will change radically without a major change also in its leadership and management. Yeah, I really struggle with this because there's in the US has this shelter centric system right and a very low tolerance relative to the rest of the world or most of the rest of the world when it comes to animals living among us. Mm -hmm. So the, the culture is that if you see an animal that is not enclosed that that's a problem and that seems to me sort of at the heart of what the actual problem is, is that we have these this national culture of um, that animals have to be confined and often that they have to be solitarily confined too, which uh, that they, they have to be alone. And so when we see multiple animals confined in one place, we immediately call someone a hoarder. What do you think about that overall? I mean, I think this is a, it, it's fairly unique to the US and a few other nations, but what do you think about that overall kind of like, do we have a chance at changing that national culture? Yeah, I think that's such an interesting, um, interesting topic. And there's actually been some really fascinating historical research written about this, the development of kind of this idea that animal bodies out of place are kind of a threat to civilization, to human civilization. And it's a relatively young idea and one that has been heavily promoted, particularly in, in uh, the United States and also in Western and Northern European countries. Um, and then was sort of propagated, you know, throughout the world also as a way of showing our superiority, you know, over uh, colonized nations, you know, by saying we don't have, you know, street dogs or village animals, you know, our dogs belong, they're, they're commodities, they're private property, they belong to individual owners. Um, you know, you know, in the book, I don't use the term owner, I always talk about companion, um, companion animals and their guardians. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I, I concur, one of the, I think the big challenge now is that we've also built our society in terms of our architectural design of space in such a way that it's not readily possible for us to have free roaming animals without those animals living lives at elevated risk for injury, right? Um, so in LA, for example, I mean, I live in one of the, I live in Los Angeles County, one of the most car centric, you know, parts of the parts of the country where we have high density in terms of our population, but nobody is using buses or public transit or only very low income people do primarily. Um, and certainly bicycle riding, you know, it's just not a thing. Um, so it's hard, right? If you see when I see a free roaming dog in that environment, I'm worried for them, not because they're what I consider a body out of place necessarily, but I'm worried they're gonna get hit by a car, right? And, and we know from, from research on, on canine cognition that dogs are actually quite savvy um, about crossing streets on their, you know, figuring it out and, and making their own way without getting hit by cars. But we also know that car strikes happen. Um, so I think, you know, I just think one of the challenges in kind of shifting people's view that animals don't have to be constantly contained, you know, also requires us to challenge just some broader social practices that we have, including the organization of our physical spaces. Um, I think it's actually, maybe you know more about this because you were in Arizona not long ago that Phoenix is now building the first car-free community. Um, you know, it'll be really interesting to see what some of their policies and practices, you know, um, emerge as in terms of what, you know, where animals can be and what animals can be doing. And then of course, the other big frame that we're always um, dealing with is public safety from the bite, the bite perspective. Um, and I don't know if you read, I should have uh, checked in with you before about this very um, widely read now New York Times article um, in which a journalist is chronicling her experience of her dog being mauled by an off-leash pit bull um, when she's, you know, out walking in the countryside. Um, you know, and that, that article has gotten more comments on it, you know, in a short period of time than I've seen on any New York Times article in a long time. Yeah, um, I saw it. 
yeah, but people are people are afraid, right? There's this sense that if, if humans are not containing their animals properly, those humans in turn are irresponsible people. And that's the general public view that I'm seeing in those chat comments about the New York Times articles. <laughs> Um, you know, that the people with the free roaming pit bull are to blame. It's not the dog's fault. It's these, it's these awful people who let him, you know, wander about. Um, but there is a, you know, strong element as well as fear and, and defensiveness and protectiveness that I think has really become a big part of our national culture, especially since 9-11. It's part of why we're also seeing so much division, you know, more broadly in the U.S. right now politically, because for the last 20 years, our country has turned in to itself. We've become so insular. And we talk about the 1950s as being this period of like the iconic nuclear family. I actually think it's now, you know, that people um, really want to only stick to their own, defend their own, um, just have this sense that we're constantly um, in danger, under duress, when in fact, by a lot of measures in the United States, we've never been safer. So it's kind of interesting. <laughs> that is so interesting. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, this this idea that we like, you know, one of the things that that I, I was in DC for a few years and it was a common practice to get to adopt dogs to bring them home and to enclose them in crates for 10 to 12 to 14 hours a day as part of like absolutely normal pet ownership and we had a really high incidence of uh, mental health issues is sort of all I all we can call them um, in dogs from that level of confinement and isolation. And I think that we have normalized isolation of animals so that when they're, and you talk about this a little bit in the book, but that the shelter actually serves as a site to normalize incarceration. Like you get little kids go there and they see all these animals in these cages and it's like, no, it's okay. And I think that, I think that's a real problem. Like it doesn't, and it doesn't even make logical sense. Like why aren't we housing dogs together? I mean, at, at a minimum, at a bare minimum, why aren't we at least, in, unless they absolutely hate other dogs, why aren't they like at least living together that might do something to change this normalization of solitary confinement of, uh, of companion animals? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And at, at PAW, at the time that I was there, small dogs were often housed together, dogs under, say, 15-ish pounds. And there were periods where the shelter was so overcrowded they, the kennels were split indoor outdoor with a guillotine door and they would put one dog on the outside of the kennel with the guillotine down and one dog on the inside if they were larger um, animals. But unless dogs were surrendered together that were big, um, big dogs never were permitted to, uh, to be in the kennel. And I, I don't think I wrote about this dog in the book, but maybe I did, I can't remember. There was one pit bull who, who became kind of the shelter celebrity because he not only figured out how to unlatch the latches on, his, on the inside of his kennel, Every night he would leave his kennel and go into the kennels of other dogs and sleep with them. And then in the morning, the staff would come and bring him back to his kennel and kind of keep, you know, keep his body in place for the duration, um, you know, of the day. Um, but a lot of these animals, you know, they, they're seeking this comfort, um, you know, and not all dogs, as you note, um, love, uh, love other dogs, but a lot of dogs do. And with the felines as well, the... Um, the ASPCA came in and made some recommendations to PAW about, you know, uh, co-housing for cats. And they built, I think at the time I was there, they had two enclosures that could house multiple cats um, in them. And those cats, they just had a completely different way of being when they were in the co-housed environment and when they were in the individual cages. Like it was quite remarkable um, to see, you know, the, the cages they were normally in were probably about two by two, maybe three by three, sort of those metal cages. Um, with the door on them all stacked up to the ceiling and um, you know when they moved them out into these spaces where they could be social with other cats but still hide if they needed to it was a really different um, experience for them yeah you know we had um at my last shelter we got a high number of cat hoarding cases and we used to put them all into their individual cages and they were dying they were like simply dying from the stress of isolation and we started housing them all in one room together and they were like totally fine they were like oh okay now we all live together in this room and i think it's a, a going back to this i think that it's actually an animal rights issue that we are housing animals in solitary confinement in shelters and i think that shelter design and a lot of the folks doing shelter design now are really thinking through these things but i think we have to completely redesign at a minimum if we're going to have massive um carceral strategies for animals we've got to be thinking about how we're housing those animals Absolutely. And I, you know, in places where there's high concentrations of people and high land costs, 
you know, there's obviously serious challenges um, to accomplishing uh, that vision, but I absolutely concur that we need to have a really radical rethinking of how animal shelters are being built and what we consider to be humane or acceptable conditions of confinement for those animals when they are there. Yeah, there's all these cool pictures from like New York and Philadelphia from the 1850s and they're just like these giant pens and they're just full of dogs, little dogs, pit bull dogs, terriers. They're just full of dogs sitting there being like, what's going on? And, you know, unfortunately yeah. their fate was going to be really horrible, but um, I, I want to shout out to my colleagues in Atlanta um, at Lifeline. They're, they had this picture of eight pit bull dogs sitting in a kennel together and it was like horrifying to people. And they were laying in a pile, like they were all asleep on this one giant crayon bed. And I thought it was so awesome, but it's it goes back to this, I think, I, I mean, when I read your book, I think so much of what happens in that book is happening outside of the public view. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about how that part needs to change, like how the invisibility of what is happening inside shelters, how we could make that more transparent and visible to the public and, and advocate for change. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think there are a couple of ways in which that could happen. And one thing I talk about about PAW, and this is really true for all of the shelters in the shelter system of which PAW is a part, it's, it's literally a hidden shelter. So to actually go and try to find PAW, you have to not only navigate yourself into an area with very poor public transit options. Um, so basically if you're not coming on a bicycle or a private vehicle, it's hard to get there. And then it's at the end of this bumpy dead end road um, in an industrial area where no, you know, there's no residences, there's no other businesses that you would visit there. Like these are industrial sites. Um, there's like a mosquito vector control thing a, a, a city bus yard I mean it's not <laughs> it's not like being next to a shopping mall right that would actually attract people um, to go there so it's it's literally hard to find there's this tiny sign that tells you that the shelter is up that road um, so it's, it's difficult to get to it's difficult to find um, and once you're there the shelter to its credit does have um, you know it is open seven days a week it does have evening business hours so people can go there at different um, different times of day, but of course a lot of what's, what's happening with the animals actually happens in the uh, the hours in which the shelter is closed from roughly uh, 7 p.m. until noon, um, you know, the following day every day. Um, and that's a long amount of, of time for there not to be any kind of uh, public access. And I, I talk in the book about how that particular time, the closing hours, is important for the animals because it's when they have privacy you know, because of how the kennels are designed, people can look in from either end um, so except for small dogs who can fit under the corunda beds, um, any other dog, you know, above 25 -ish pounds or so can't hide. Um, so when people are there, it's annoying, right? And they, the dogs bark, they get upset, they get worked up and so forth. The, the flip side of that is, um, you know, that the rituals of feeding, the rituals of cleaning, um, the rituals of killing um, are all things that the public doesn't see, um, doesn't doesn't witness, doesn't experience. And even a lot of the positive activities that take place at the shelter also aren't happening when the shelter is actually open to the public, like the more recent dog play groups um, that take place. They're heavily concentrated in hours when the shelter is close to the public because there's more staff availability um, at that time. So I think, you know, even just relocating shelters into areas where people actually want to go and can get to um, right, is, is a very basic thing to do to make shelters more accessible and, and more transparent. Um, to also bring shelter animals into other environments, I think is another way to do that, not as effectively, but I think there is value to, you know, off-site adoption events and bringing shelter animals out into uh, the community. We're also developing various kinds of educational and outreach programs with local organizations. When I was at PAW, there was a constant um, I would be yeah, a genuinely constant level of interest on the part of different kinds of community groups, local church groups, the Girl Scout troop uh, <laughs> in the community, the sixth grade teacher, you know, all these people who I'd see come into the shelter asking, you know, how they could get involved or use the shelter in an educational way um, to help teach some part of the community more about the shelter. And PAW just didn't have any person, you know, whose responsibility that was. And when volunteers offered, it was viewed as a liability issue to bring shelter animals off-site into other, you know, other environments um, that there would be problems with liability. And similarly, it would be a problem to bring certain types of groups into the shelter um, who weren't official volunteers, i.e. who hadn't gone through 40 hours of training 
um, you know, to be there and kind of be more in the behind the scenes spaces at the shelter. And I think that kind of gatekeeping is problematic as well. Of course, we need to balance safety. Um, you know, it's unfortunate in the United States in particular that we have this litigious culture so that, you know, if somebody does get nipped or slams the kennel door on their hand, you know, there is the fear that they're going to they're going to turn around and sue a shelter system. But we have to find some kind of balance that makes these places more accessible and more transparent for different kinds of groups so that they can experience what the shelter environment is like, you know, develop some empathy um, for, uh, for the animals who are impounded there and also have a sense that they, as part of the community, um, are responsible for what is happening there and that they can hold other people responsible for it too, particularly, you know, management and policy makers. Yeah, yeah, I think that the just having even having behind the scenes areas of shelters that aren't critical medical areas doesn't really make a lot of sense. So in the book, you know, I, I, when you talk to shelter directors and talk about what animals are dying in shelters, they're going to tell you cats and pit bulls, uh, pretty much across the board. And with cats, you know, we know the solution. We just have to do it, which is to stop taking healthy cats into shelters and to, to leave them alone and have shelters care for the cats that really need help. But for pit bull dogs, I think that this, this end game is kind of around the corner where we do have this this challenge and the, and and it, you articulate it so well in the book that how complex it is and how the pit bull becomes this site of all these other social factors and I, I wondered if you could talk a little bit about that and and if and I and I guess specifically touching on, did you feel especially connected to pit bull dogs because of what you described the sort of uh, issues that they face. Yeah, absolutely. So indeed, you know, cats and pit bulls are the two kind of problem or challenging populations in uh, in animal shelters. And at the time I was doing my field work, the outcomes for both of those groups of animals was really poor. Um, you know, the kill rate for cats was around, I think, 80 to 85 percent for most of the field work period. And for pit bull type dogs, it was, you know, 55 to 60 percent of those dogs weren't weren't leaving the shelter. Those numbers, I'm happy to report, have changed um, a lot in a positive direction um, since since I completed field work. So that's good, but there's still uh, still plenty um, you know plenty of work uh, to do. Um, you know, and as you said, um, Kristen, I, I talk in the book about the ways in which there's various kinds of social meanings that are attached to pit bulls, particularly around race and class and gender. These are animals who have come to be seen, you know, starting in the mid part of the 20th century, but really spiking in the 1980s and the 1990s. It's almost really an extension um, of our cultural belief in this dangerous person who is the black man um, in the United States. Um, and black men and pit bulls are just seen as being alike in terms of their specific characteristics, as being violent, as being out of control, as being threats to white spaces and to white bodies and to white property. Um, you know, and, and animal control agencies, animal shelters, you know, have operated for so long as a policing agency. And what we're starting to see now, of course, is more of a transition um, away from the policing model and into a model of thinking about animal shelters as being kind of community resource centers. Um, but this doesn't undo the fact that we now have, you know, at least 40 years of this kind of specific history with this one type of dog, um, you know, the, the, uh, the pit bulls. Um, you know, and I, I think in a lot of ways, although it's obviously a, you know, a terrible situation for those specific animals, the Michael Vick dog fighting case in uh, 2007 was kind of the best thing that happened to American pit bulls, because it really gave the, the small number of people, particularly white people who were advocating for those dogs an opportunity to show the public that those animals were in fact victims, um, right, of, of black men, mind you, so there's a strong racist component to this as well. Um, rather, uh, rather than being kind of extensions of them. So now we're kind of caught, and I think we're still in this space between the sort of narrative of sort of pit bull redemption um, that, that pit bull advocates um, are promoting, but still an immense amount of latent fear. Just circling back to that New York Times article again, without wanting to uh, spend, spend too much time on it, but it's amazing to me um, to see in the comments how strong and powerful the negative attitudes towards pit bulls continue um, to be. Um, so, you know, in certain certain areas in Los Angeles where there's a lot of kind of gen, this is gen Z 
um, and maybe the millennial hipsters, you know, having a pit bull, um, you know, is a sign of kind of status and coolness. Um, and, you know, it's something I've talked about uh, elsewhere that kind of modern day capitalism, um, you know, relies on individuals who, who see themselves as being tolerant and flexible, right? That's at the heart of kind of American ideology and sense of self um, right now. But that kind of flexible tolerance also um, allows more privileged uh, people like white people and more affluent people to keep thinking about themselves and also our society as being fair and maintaining kind of individualistic logics. And I think what we're seeing now is that pit bulls and pit bull adoption have kind of become a low stakes and low investment way for white people and other maybe advantaged, more advantaged people of color, like certain populations of Asian Americans, for example. Um, you know, to, to demonstrate that they have racial and class flexibility, i.e. that they're not racist, that they're not classist, that they're not elitist um, individuals, when at the same time, those exact same people would be opposed to sort of significant investments in actually challenging um, white dominance and white supremacy in our society, like actually sending their children to underperforming local public schools. Um, you know, we're promoting the construction of low-income housing in their own, um, you know, in their own neighborhoods, or even supporting things like living wages and, you know, other kinds of anti-poverty programs. Um, so I think that, you know, the pit bulls are kind of stuck in this really interesting social space right now, um, caught between some of these existing and long-standing um, racist associations, along with, you know, a, a because of that, that their symbolism now is a way for people to demonstrate, um, you know, that they are open-minded and they are tolerant by adopting a pit bull. Um, and so we're, we're seeing obviously, I think nationwide that the adoption rate for pit bulls has gone up um, in animal shelters, which is great um, that the rate of pit bulls being killed in animal shelters um, has gone down. Um, but I think that this is gonna be like the most stubborn group um, for us to, you know, address uh, in, uh, in the longer term because we haven't gotten rid of or addressed those you know deeper social meanings um, around pit bulls. Yeah. You also asked me in a sort of oh sorry go ahead. <laughs> well I want to say that I think we could spend a whole hour talking about this New York Times article because it's just you know my jaw <laughs> kind of dropped reading it because it's just uh there's a lot there. Um, and I think it, what I think the important thing for people viewing today is that articles like that really need to be viewed through a critical lens, right? Like there is a, a cert, there is a definite purpose to writing an article about that, that like that, that isn't really even about the dogs themselves. And I thought the fact that, uh, that the death sentence um, articulated in the terms that you would talk about a person being sentenced to death was a really uh, fascinating choice. And really problematic choice. Uh, but um, this article is an example of how um, the people that own pit bull dogs are stigmatized. And in shelters, what happens to those of us running shelters is we are punished if a pit bull dog, a dog perceived to be a pit bull dog, which, you know, who knows what that means. If a dog um, in that fits within that definition bites anyone, I mean, the first thing we ask is, is it a pit bull? And it's not because that matters, it's because the perception uh, is so uh, problematic. And I don't know, I, I think overturning breed discrimination is obviously a first step, but I just don't know how you get pit bull dogs out of this mess. I mean, they are so reified. And so they've just been turned into these. Uh, and, and I think you talk about how uh, white people dress them up and try to like increase their whiteness. And at first I really didn't agree with you on that, but then I started seeing it everywhere. And it's really sad for the dogs because they're just dogs. And I don't know how we as a movement now at this point beyond getting rid of breed discrimination, get past this stuff. Like, do we just have to keep talking about it and dig in and look at it critically? Yeah, I think we have to keep talking about it and really challenging our own practices as well. Um, you know, I know one of the, the changes, well, one of the claims, I should say, I talk in the book about how the, the shelter I call PAW um, still utilizes temperament testing, um, specifically for dogs that are identified as dominant breed dogs. Um, and dominant breed dogs in PAW's system obviously includes pit bulls, but it includes 14 other breeds and types of dogs, not all of which I can remember here, but includes Sharpays, Rottweilers, um, Akitas, some animals you might think would be there like German Shepherds or Dobermans are not on the list, 
Um, <laughs> so it's, it's kind of a curious list. Um, and the shelter always defends itself um, and um, more recently has actually stopped using a dominant breed list and now temperament tests all dogs, I think over 45 pounds is their more recent policy. And they say, well, we're not discriminating or targeting based on breed because we administer these tests to all dogs that are dominant breed dogs, right? Was the policy for more than a decade. And then much more recently to all dogs over this certain weight threshold. Um, but it's really important for us to be aware of and talk about the idea of differential impact um, as well, which it, is a concept that, that draws attention to how a policy or practice that can seem neutral impacts members of some groups more than others. Um, so when a, you know, a high-end investing firm, for example, makes it their practice to meet with their clients at the local golf club um, for, uh, for lunch, that's a practice that's going to ex exclude women investment bankers because women are much less likely to golf right, than men. So it's not like an explicitly sexist practice or policy, but it's one that has a differential impact on women. And we see the same thing happening with pit bulls. Even if we say the test is for all dogs, we know that A, of course, the pit bulls are there in greater number, but also the lens through which they're viewed by the people making the assessments is different. Um, and so even if we are suddenly blanket testing all animals, we're still subjecting the animals um, you know, to a, a a higher degree of scrutiny when we believe them to fall into this category, um, you know, pit bulls. And I think shelters really need to talk about that and say, what, you know, what, what are our feelings, you know, as members of the staff? Also, what are our own experiences? Because I know there are people at PAW who have been badly injured by different dogs, not necessarily all pit bulls, but we nobody talks about it. It's always like the secret when there were injuries, when it happened to volunteers or staff, it's like, you don't, you don't talk about it. You might say very casually, you know, as you do when somebody's had a cold, like, are you feeling better? But there's never like a processing at that moment. And it is a trauma. And anyone, I'm sure many people on this call, like myself, have either been bitten by a dog and or have been, you know, um, a human uh, interlocutor or some kind in a, in a dog fight. It's traumatic. Right? <laughs> and we don't talk about those traumas and how they might inform our responses to particular dogs. My wife was, was, was mauled by a, a golden retriever as a child, and she has a longstanding issue with that brie. Like we see them on the street, we're out of there. <laughs> and so people, you know, we, we ground it not just in cultural frames, but also individual experiences. And when those things support each other, i.e. when we live in a society that already has these negative views of pit bull type dogs, but then also we become a victim in some way of aggression by a pit bull type dog. That's just going to amplify, um, you know, everything. And I think that we need to, we need to talk about those those feelings on an emotional um, level as well. Um, you know, what are our fears and our concerns about these particular dogs? Where did they originate from? And to have these conversations among staff um, and probably also among volunteers, you know, who are working with animals and with uh, with members of the public. One of the things that we hear in animal welfare is people talk about racism against pit bulls. Would you use that language or, and why or why not? Um, it's not, it's not language. I'm just thinking about it. It's not language that I have used to talk specifically about racism against pit bulls. I, I do hear and I've seen a lot, particularly around breed, breed specific legislation you know, in the re revocation of that in um, Denver just recently, there was a lot of BSL talk and I can't remember if it was Montreal a few years ago that introduced it for the first time and then retracted it again. You know, people talk about that as being, um, you know, racism against dogs um, or pit bulls. And I, I think we have to be sensitive to, to the, the historical specificity, you know, of different uh, structures of social inequalities in our society. Um, so I'm, I'm ca cautious about using racism. I think it's actually sort of a, a you know, a unique um, combination of speciesism and, uh, and racism that work together and how people view pit bulls. But it's not, when people say racism against pit bulls, I think what they're usually talking about is the breed specific legislation, right? The policies of discrimination. Um, also insurance companies and landlords, for example, prohibiting pit bulls. That's racism against pit bulls. But if I were to talk about racism against pit bulls, it wouldn't be because of that. It would be more in the context of the ways in which pit bulls have been associated with and attached to urban black um, and in, in some places like Los Angeles, Latinx men's masculinity. 
um, and that the racism isn't actually these policies per se, it's this broader social view in the first place that these animals are problematic because they're perceived as belonging to this threatening and dangerous group of humans. It's really interesting. Um, I can't believe the time has flown so much and I don't, there's something I wanna talk about um, that's sort of unrelated, which is people. And we, you know, you talk in the book about sort of protecting animals from people who are perceived as not adequate owners. And I think we, people are poor and struggling, like not, like they haven't for a very, very long time. And um, people are uh, living in their cars with their animals. Um, and I wonder, what would you say to someone who says that animals all deserve a warm home and a bed and if people lose their homes or they, you know, they can't afford the food for their animal, they really shouldn't have them. I think where I always try to meet people who define themselves as animal lovers is through identifying compassion. Um, and most people who have those kinds of feelings on some level are expressing that out of a place of compassion for animals, but one that clearly is overriding compassion that they might be experiencing or able to experience for fellow humans. Um, you know, so I think in, in facing those kinds of individuals, I tend to think about and encourage them to think about what it means to be compassionate to them. Uh, and in this world more broadly, what it means for us to have and develop systems of care and caring for each other in which all life forms can flourish, um, not just our particular chosen uh, life forms that we're valuing um, over others. You know, we hear these same kinds of debates as well or, or arguments around children um, and poverty um, in the United States where there's often this idea that poor people shouldn't have kids or they don't have a right to have kids if they don't have the resources to raise them in a particular way and why should the rest of us you know, be paying for those kids. And those kinds of ideologies, again, tend to be deeply grounded in racist ideologies, um, you know, dating back now hundreds and hundreds of years in the US about what kinds of bodies should be reproducing and who has the right to what we would consider, I hope, um, you know, fundamental human, uh, human rights, right? The right to reproduce and form a family, the right to develop meaningful companionship bonds with other people or with animals um, should be what we see as part of basic human rights. Um, and so it's certainly my position, I think that's clear, uh, clear in the book that, you know, I think our best way forward in trying to um, alleviate the, the problems facing um, poor people who are living with animals who maybe they can't provide the level of care for that we would all like is to radically in, improve our access to affordable housing Certainly in Los Angeles, we have a huge crisis with that. It's one of the most expensive cities to live in in the country. Um, and we also, as probably some people on this call know, have uh, also one of the nation's highest per capita rates of unhoused individuals. Um, you know, we need to be addressing also within the animal sheltering movement, not just providing sort of stopgap services, like here, have a bag of food, but also committing ourselves as people who are committed to the welfare of animals, to committing ourselves to the welfare of people um, because when we improve the welfare of people, we also improve the welfare of animals. So if all of us who volunteer for animal rescues and are working in shelters, et cetera, you know, were to also extend some of our energy to writing to our local policymakers, um, promoting uh, low income housing construction, promoting more rent control units, promoting the abolition of, uh, of uh, pet landlord restrictions on, on housing units, which is something that's now happening, I think, in um, Victoria, uh, no, sorry, Vancouver, is it Vancouver or Victoria? Sorry if there are any Canadians on the call that I'm being an ignoramus and confusing these, but these are actually things that are starting to happen in some places, um, you know, that would make it much easier uh, for lower income people to find housing with companion animals and to retain those bonds um, that, uh, that allow them to, to thrive, that allow all of us to thrive. Yeah, I mean, I think there's so many issues that we could be tackling with humans. I think it's um, it's in Australia, I think it's in, um, I forget where in Australia, but the um, Animal Justice Party is passing legislation so that people that move into um, uh, assisted living homes uh, have to be able to stay with their animal. And it's the, these kinds of efforts that I think uh, could make such a, such a difference for people and pets and, and reduce the animals coming into the institution.
We have just a couple more minutes left and we have a number of questions. Um, it's very hard to pick. And so um, I want to go to one um, that is about, uh, about policing. Um, so this is probably the last question we'll have time to get to. And um, it says the issue of shelters as an organizational function of policing and jailing in many communities is profound and underappreciated. How would reorganization away from police departments change outcomes? Um, is there a movement to shift field staff from police train control officers to social workers? Yeah, that's a fantastic question. Um, I can answer part of it. And Kristen, you might actually be in a better position. <laughs> I'm gonna let you answer uh, part of it. And I have some very naughty dog things. I can hear crinkling a paper. <laughs> so I'm gonna let you answer okay. the first part. I will be back, you keep talking. Okay. <laughs> we all have these situations uh, sometimes. Um, so I think, yeah, this is such a great question. And I think it's, it's really helpful. And it's one of the, you know, the, the, key arguments that I make in the book that we need to be thinking about animal shelters right now is largely operating as carceral institutions, as jails, uh, you know, jails for dogs and cats and other animals as well often. Um, and I think moving away from, uh, from a policing model could radically uh, transform the kinds of outcomes that we, that we see in animal sheltering uh, because it would really open up possibilities for a more uh, compassionate approach again towards both people and towards animals. Um, when I was doing um, field work at Paul, what I consistently observed was a high level of hostility on the part of staff towards the members of the public who came in seeking services, even when those were people who were like doing the right thing, like people who are coming in to pay for their licensing fees or coming in to ask about how they could get their cat, um, you know, spayed or neutered. Even those individuals who weren't, you know, surrendering animals were, were treated often with contempt um, on the part of, part of the staff. And I think that does really stem from uh, very heavily from this kind of policing orientation that the animal shelter had an had an us versus them attitudes for the community that we are, you know, we are the unfortunate humans who are responsible for dealing with all of the mistakes, um, you know, and, and animal criminality uh, of the adjacent community. When we're able to set that aside is when we open up space for actually looking in our communities and saying, to ourselves and asking the important questions of what can we do in this community that would make it easier for animals and people to live um, peacefully together and to have meaningful uh, long-term proximal um, relationships uh, with one another. Those answers might be housing, um, they might be fencing, they might be better access to low-cost veterinary care, they might be uh, food issues, right? There's so many different things that might come out of that, but we have to move away from that policing um, orientation. Um, and one thing I talk about in the book that's a really concrete step that I think shelters could take, but I'm not currently familiar with, um, with any that do, but Kristen, this is why I think you might be able, better able to answer the second part of the question is like, you know, are shelters doing this? Um, you know, I recommend having a community advisory board that there's some kind of um, actual community oversight and involvement um, over uh, animal shelters. So that it's not just animal shelters assuming that they know um, what is best for the local community. And that was always one of the very puzzling things about managerial decisions at PAW was that they were based in claims of expertise when no one ever actually did any kind of research in the community to find out what the needs of the community were. They were just all about their perception, uh, right, of, of community needs. Um, and, that, and that's really problematic. So if we can get, you know, people from communities involved in shelters, not just, you know, volunteering to take care of animals, but volunteering in roles where they actually influence, you know, policies and practices, I think that would be hugely influential. And or if we also make more of an effort in the sheltering industry to go out and talk to members of the community about their needs, whether it's through focus groups or surveys or, you know, other tools that we have available to us, um, you know, to to keep, help keep animals and people together. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Gunther. And I just want to say, if you have not gotten the book, it's The Lives and Deaths of Shelter Animals. Um, pick it up, order it. It is an amazing read. Uh, it is, and if you, you know, if you do want to reach out to Dr. Gunther, I recommend reading the book first because you're going to learn so much reading it. Probably the questions you have for her will, uh, will change, but we, you know, 
Uh, I just want to say thank you because this book has impacted so many people's lives and it spoke so much to so many of us in animal welfare. And I feel like we're just really getting started with the conversation with you. And um, we feel really grateful to have you be sort of part of our movement uh, and part of the animal welfare changes that are happening. So your time is so appreciated and uh, you, your name is getting said all over the animal welfare scene. So, uh, so welcome and thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much for having me. It's so great to be able to speak with uh, with you. You too. So thank you all for, for tuning in today. I appreciate you. Thanks so much. Um, everybody have a great night. Thank you so much for joining us. We do these webcasts really often. Please check out Human Animal Support Services website for information about webcasts just like this. We're gonna continue these conversations and, uh, and we will be trying to get Dr. Gunther back soon. So um, stay tuned and thanks for being with us tonight.